So through my involvement with the AZA and their programming committee, I've had the tremendous opportunity to collaborate with some of the most passionate and talented leaders in the world of zoos and aquariums. Tim Morrow is one such leader. When you hear what he has to say about the future perception of zoos and aquariums and the important aspect of storytelling, you'll not only get a true sense of his passion for this incredibly hot topic, you'll also want to join him as he creates a new path forward in this truly unique world. Introducing Tim Morrow. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Who here went to the circus when they were a child or with their kids? <laughs> I did too, and it reminded remind me, I've been the demo for the circus three times now because I have a, myself as a child, I have a 25-year-old son who I took when he was small, and I have a five and a seven-year-old now, so I've been the demo three times. And if you ever get a chance to, to look at the history of Ringling Brothers, it's amazing. It started off as with wagons going across the country, and they had pre-teams that would go in and mark, blitz the, the town with posters, and the other circuses would come in and rip them down and put their posters up, and uh, then it, it moved to trains and things like that. But um, the most impressive thing about Ringling to me was the merchandising. <laughs> if you ever went to a Ringling Brothers show, there was somebody on the aisle selling stuff. You walked to the top of the aisle, there was somebody selling stuff. You walked into the plaza, there was somebody selling stuff. And even at the end of the show, you walked outside and somebody was selling stuff. So they definitely had that down. Um, I'm a CEO of San Antonio Zoo and the Will Smith Zoo School. Not that Will Smith, we'll get to that in a little bit. But I'm just gonna tell a little bit about telling your story and the importance of that and how we're doing it at San Antonio Zoo. And I think explaining my path to the zoo will help better explain where I'm coming from. I started really uh, on a career focused on fun in the theme park world. I moved to San Antonio in 1991, and Opryland was opening a theme park called Fiesta Texas, and I said, oh, I'll go be a lifeguard there for the summer. And then I, wasn't, I was going to school to be law enforcement because my dad was an FBI agent, so I wasn't gonna go back, and then they called me and said, hey, we want you to be a, a trainer next year, can you come back? And I said, okay, well, I have nothing else to do this summer, I'll do that again, and that happened four times. I kept saying no, and I kept going back. In 1996, SeaWorld um, called me, and said, hey, we want you to come around the water park at SeaWorld. And I was like, nope, don't want to, this is not what I want to do. I'm going to school to be law enforcement. <laughs> so I just kept getting pulled back in, pulled back in. Um, I did some consulting work at Parque Plaza Sesamo down in Monterrey, Mexico. I got to help open that park, so that was a great experience. And then I spent 19 years with SeaWorld Parks and Entertainment, mostly in San Antonio. And then I moved to Orlando to op open Discovery Cove, a dolphin swim resort there next door to SeaWorld Orlando. And then came back eventually to Texas. Uh, at Texas, I had a wide variety of experiences and jobs, everything from the front gate to the landscaping to the rides to the Clydesdales to the warehouses, you name it, the PR, um, events and concerts. I got to do a little bit of everything, so it was a great experience. In 2012, we opened Aquatica San Antonio, which is a SeaWorld-themed uh, water park. Um, and that was a great experience, being part of that design team and part of that um, opening and operation of that. And then before I left, designing Discovery Point, which is almost a little miniature model of Discovery Cove right there in, C in SeaWorld San Antonio. And then the zoo called me out of the blue, a headhunter for the zoo, and said, hey, we're looking for someone to come be the CEO of the zoo. And I was like, nope, I don't want to leave SeaWorld. I'm staying here forever. Kept calling me, and it was like, just like my job at SeaWorld. And finally, I caved, and I went and walked it one day, and I was like, wow, this place is kind of stuck in time. I think I could really help it with my experience that I've gained at, at SeaWorld. So in 2014, I moved to the San Antonio Zoo. And so to transition a little bit from what Juliet was saying, because the circus really was the first time Americans, North Americans, and people even in Mexico and Canada saw elephants and lions and tigers. There was no internet, there was no TV, no YouTube. Um, try telling that to your kids today and see, watch their faces. Um, but they really introduced all those animals across the country and, and took those animals all over the country. And that's when people started falling in love with those animals. Um, some things that people don't know they do, they do cancer research. So elephants are, are not likely to get cancer. So they partnered with doctors out of Salt Lake City who were doing blood tests and DNA sampling of elephants and finding the genes in the elephants and the DNA that can stop cancer. So this is all, Ringling Brothers have been doing this the entire time that they were in operation and they're still doing it today. And then they have a, a large herd of elephants, I believe 40 elephants left at their facility in, in Florida. So um, they're contributing to that population in the United States. There's less than 35,000 Asian elephants left on the planet in the wild. And African elephants are killed at a rate of 96 a day. So we're losing, these species are gonna be gone before our children are gone probably. So they'll be seeing them in a museum. The picture, um, Ringling Brothers, when I got to San Antonio Zoo, we had one elephant, so we were getting a lot of bad PR, bad press, and uh, we partnered with Ringling Brothers, and they um, 
loaned us to elephants, Nicole and Karen. So this is our, we call them the golden girls. And uh, they've become great friends. They, um, we brought them one at a time. Nicole came first. The Ringling Brothers staff came down, met our elephant, who's very picky, who she's with. Um, they came down and said, we have the perfect elephant. Her name is Nicole. Come visit her when we come off the road. So I went to the facility in Florida, and Nicole was side by side with an elephant named Karen. And so we said, we can't split those girls up. So in order to not have a mean girl syndrome, we brought Nicole first, and then we brought Karen a few months later, and they've done great ever since. So, and then uh, two years ago, we actually officially adopted um, Karen and Nicole. So Ringling Brothers donated those elephants to us. So a little bit about the challenge of zoo, zoo design. I don't know, is Brian Morrow here? This is one of his renderings. Uh, he's, we're not related, he's my brother from another, but um, there's a lot of challenges with zoo design. Um, every, uni every environment is unique. You're really designing exhibits for multiple audiences. So first it's the animals to create naturalistic habitats. Um, you have to design it for the animal care specialist to be able to work with the animals. You have to follow the guidelines of AZA, ZAA, OSHA, uh, USDA, and everyone else you're dealing with. And then of course you have to create great guest experiences to see those animals or interact or be able to uh, view those animals. And then society's expectations of what an animal exhibit now has changed drastically over the last 20, 30 years. So um, you have to take all those factors into account Click. Um, a lot of zoos are old, and ours is no exception. We were, we're uh, started in 1914, so one of the older zoos in the country. And there's a lot of old exhibitry still. You'll see it to most zoos you go to today, a lot of older sections. Um, in our zoo, we were the first zoo in the country with cageless exhibits. So we had the moat systems. Um, this is still existing today, but this is one of the things on our list to redo in our master plan. Um, you can see here chain link fencing, which has all come out now in the last couple of years. Um, this was our monkey house built in the 40s with square cages on the side of a historic building that we took down two years ago. And then here, we, it's hard to see, but we have historic walls. A lot of our zoo was built during the WPA, so we, our, the theme of our zoo was um, old. <laughs> so, some people call it charming, some people call it classic. It was really old. So we have to work very closely with our historic commission on what we do with the walls because they're, they are valuable walls and a lot of hand-carved concrete and beautiful work. But... Um, the, the way we've changed exhibit design, we're having to do a lot of changes, so they love me and they're terrified of me at the same time at the Historic Commission. <laughs> and so we've really been working to cast a new vision. Uh, I've been at the zoo four years now. We've really been um, working hard to flip it, really um, tell our story better. And um, some of the things we're doing, this is an image of one of the exhibits that we opened in 2015. Um, it's our lion habitat. This was a moated exhibit. Um, the moat was failing. It's a WPA wall, so they didn't use rebar then. It's literally rock and, and mortar. Um, and that would have been a bad thing if that wall had collapsed. So we closed it and redid this exhibit. Um, if you've ever seen the movie Zookeeper, this is um, the star of the movie Zookeeper right here in the cartoon character. So we, we put little Easter eggs in our renderings. Um, but this exhibit opened in 2015. And the next video I'm going to show you is we've done two videos now really showing, and we really pound these on social, um, what our vision is as a zoo because people still question what zoos are here for. And so these videos kind of tell the story of what we're here for and what we're doing. The last few years at San Antonio Zoo, we've really focused on creating a better guest experience and better habitats for our animals, and we have a lot of great things planned for the future. We have big dreams and great plans. We want to expand our habitats, expand our footprint, grow the zoo. We have an amazing master plan that you'll see over the next 20 years. We'll create one of the greatest zoos in the country, if not the greatest zoo in the country. A lot of the new experience we've added at the zoo allows people to get very close to the animals and really creates a connection between the guest and the animal. That allows us to talk about our conservation efforts worldwide and what we're doing to secure a future for wildlife. San Antonio Zoo has been here over 100 years and we're very much looking forward to the next 100 years as we grow our conservation efforts, grow our educational programs and create a worldwide impact on wildlife. We are world leaders and innovators in conservation and education. There's a lot going on behind the scenes that the everyday guests might not even be aware of. Our education department operates the nation's largest nature-based preschool and hosts thousands of children every year with field trips and programming. Our conservation research department is leading programs all over the world from China to Japan to Peru, the Gulf of Mexico and beyond. And all these things are made possible when you visit San Antonio Zoo. Over the next 20 years, our guests are gonna see us grow. We will create world-class habitats. We'll bring more interactive experiences. And we will have a continued focus on conservation and education. Let's get bigger and wilder at San Antonio Zoo.
As we really launched into um, redefining ourselves, we knew we had to um, start everything with our mission and our vision as a nonprofit and somebody that's focused on conservation of research and education, we, we started from scratch. So we, we created a new vision of securing a future for wildlife and we came up with the acronym LEAP. So we ask our guests to leap with us and it's to love, engage with, act for and protect wild animals in the places they live. So um, we really wanted to give our, before our mission statement was about a paragraph long and used words from the 1950s and I had to Google it every time somebody asked me what it was. So we really want to create something short and simple that all of our team members can, uh, could remember. Down to the logo, putting the uh, a giraffe and the rhino in the um, logo was really our message to the world that we are focused on conservation of those two species and, and many others on the planet. So we've been reimagining the zoo the last few years. As you saw in the video, we had a giraffe feeding experience and a, an expanded savanna habitat for, for the giraffes. As you saw earlier, we, we have the golden girls now and we expanded that habitat. We had a moat system on that as well and we filled that in and lined it with um, big trees to create shade, both for the guests and for the elephants, making a more naturalistic habitat. The lion habitat on the right, um, is literally those lions are face to face a quarter inch away from the kids all the time. They chase kids up and down the windows and you listen to the parents, oh look, they want to play, the, the lion likes you, he wants to play with you. <laughs> yes, kind of. Um, <laughs> and then uh, you, you saw a little bit of it, a little teaser and then you're seeing another video in a little bit that um, we have an enrichment activity where our lions can do tug of war with the guest and we have um, five lions, four of them are kind of over it but one really loves doing it right now. It's a two year old female named Excel and so that's a really fun activity for the cats to do. Uh, we've also opened the nation's largest nature-based preschool. Um, it's Will Smith Zoo School. It's named after this is our donor in the picture, and her son's name was Will Smith, who was killed when he was eight years old in a car wreck. Um, but uh, we, we grand opened that school at the new location in January of last year, and it's been, it's been at our zoo for 16 years, so it's a nature-based program. And I think the next talk is about safety and seesaws, but when you see our playground, it's not the normal playground that's going to freak the safety guys out. So <laughs> um, it's a nature-based school, so they are outside. Our conservation and research center is one of the largest subterranean uh, labs on the planet. Uh, we're focused on subterranean species. In San Antonio, we're on top of an aquifer, so we have some endangered species in there um, from our own aquifer. We have some species that there's only three of in the care of man on the planet that maybe 100 people have ever seen. Um, and the federal government, we're one of the places the federal government calls whenever they have issues with salamanders or subterranean species. We also work in China and Japan with subterranean species there and um, recently have launched a horned toad um, reintroduction program. Is anybody from Texas? If you're from Texas, you'll know what a horned toad is and we're trying to keep those from going on the endangered species list. Um, our animal health center expanded this year. We added a de dedicated surgical suite and pharmacy and lab. It was an original hospital built in the 70s, very small, so we've modernized that. And then people, like I was saying before, we're doing all this investment into the zoo and, and all this investment in conservation in the field, but people ask, why does the zoo even have to exist? So we always tell people what they, don't even, they don't see a fraction of what we do. When someone comes to visit the zoo, it's about this much of what we're actually doing and the work that our team is doing. Really, we're a center behind the scenes of conservation and research. We have a department led by two PhDs and a team of about 10 in that conservation research department. They're literally all over the planet all the time. Um, our education department runs the largest nature-based preschool in the country. We host about a hun almost 100,000 school field trips a year. Um, they lead a team of 600 volunteers and docents and uh, camps. So we basically have programming from um, cradle to cane and we um, have educational aspects for everybody. We do a lot of scientific work at the zoo with the AZA and with our conservation research department and the federal government and the state government. And then we're very focused on, we are a nonprofit at San Antonio Zoo, but we want to give back to our community. Already this first quarter of the year, we've given away $800,000 worth of tickets and experiences back into the community through things like United Way. So very focused on giving back to the community. Thank you. Um, we do glo global conservation products, I pro projects. I don't know if you saw in the news lately, they've closed down Komodo Island because people were stealing the Komodo dragons off of the island. So they're about worth about $35,000 on the black market. We have staff that goes down there and works. So it's probably only zoological staff going to that island anymore. But just last week, they announced that they're closing that down to the public because people were stealing these dragons. Um, at the zoo, we have about 750 species, and of those, 178 are a part of species survival plans, and that's a managed program of all the animals across the accredited zoos in the country and other, some other countries to keep, try to keep 100 years of um, bloodline and genes of that species in the care of man 100 years out because they're disappearing in the wild. We want to make sure that we can take care of those for 100 years. And then boots on the ground, we have people, like I said earlier, um, our VP of conservation research is right now, I think, in Peru. 
Um, he's, he's, I have to have a calendar of where he is in the world because it's either Peru, China, Chile, the Gulf of Mexico, Japan, um, Mexico. And when he goes in the Gulf, he's doing some research on the very bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. He, he calls it going on a cruise, which is really funny because he's on this little research ship. <laughs> but I told him he needs to stop calling it a cruise. People just think he's out having fun. But we're leading funding or participating in conservation efforts all across the country. And this is a little video of one of our projects in Peru. Piece of art helps save wildlife and support the people that allow us to do this. I have been working in the Amazon basin for all of my professional life. It's a place that means a lot to me. And the indigenous groups are the groups that I've been working with all of that time. The San Antonio Zoo is purchasing arts and crafts from indigenous groups, exporting those from Peru, and then selling those items in our gift stores. We use a Japanese fish print artist or Giyutaku artist. We cover the fish with a dye, and then we take rice paper, lay that down on the fish, and actually press that out and print the fish onto the rice paper. And those are the finished art products that, that we're left with. The goal of our project is to secure the patches of rainforest on the traditional lands of indigenous groups in the Peruvian Amazon. These forest patches are the most biodiverse corner of the planet. What we are focused on is providing the indigenous groups with a revenue stream that has nothing to do with oil extraction, mineral extraction, or timber harvest. But we will have this artwork available in our gift stores here at the zoo so that our patrons can help support this very, very important conservation project. Securing a future for wildlife demands creative solutions, and this is certainly one of them. That's, that's Dante, the most interesting man in the world, I call him. But the, I, went, I got to go down there last year and meet that tribe. The gentleman with all the um, teeth around his neck was the chief, and he was, at the time we visited, in the hospital in Lima, Peru. And um, the tribe has, those tribes don't use currency. They trade with each other. So uh, what happens is when they get sick or something like that happens, um, they need money. They need cash to deal with Western medicine and Western hospitals. And the, the miners or the loggers will come in and say, hey, we'll give you medicine, but we want the rights to mine or log your land. So what we've done is teach them how to do those Japanese fish prints. We buy them from them. We buy goods from them. We sell them here in the United States. And um, if they ever need money, they call us and we go down so they don't have to call the miners or the loggers in to sell their land off. So by an art project, we're protecting rainforest, which is pretty incredible. This is a picture of our zoo in the 1800s when the Colonel Brackridge, who donated Brackridge Park, had some buffalo and some lions and some monkeys on the, on the property. And then we became an official zoo at our location in 1914. And we've been growing and moving forward ever since. Uh, we, just we just opened a, southern white, a new southern white rhino habitat, and um, that was a space that was divided into three small spaces before. We've opened it up into one, connected it into the draft savanna, so animals can move back and forth between the savannas, added waterfalls, trees, and more, um, a more naturalistic habitat, which it's interesting to hear people watch the exhibit now and say, oh, they look so happy, they look so happy. It's the same rhinos, but they look so happy. <laughs> Um, putting a big parking garage in, which we need. We have a big parking shortage, and this garage will sit about five stories over the top of the big highway that goes right down the middle of San Antonio. So that's, that's our new billboard reminding everyone that San Antonio Zoo is there. Um, we'll be creating a, an, an incredible jaguar walk that'll go over a guest pathway into another ex in through another exhibit and hook to a third exhibit. So giving our jaguars four times the space that they've had before using old historic existing spaces. When we rebuilt our rhino habitat, we brought in this sculpture. It's 18 feet tall and about 18 tons, and it represents the last three rhinos, northern white rhinos on the planet. They're down to two now. Fort, this was on display in New York City. Uh, went on display in March 14th last year in New York City, and four, day, four days later, Sudan, the last rhino, last male rhino on, on the bottom passed away, so now there's just the two females, so that, that species is extinct. But don't worry, zoos have collected things they need to collect to hopefully bring that species back. Um, so we'll see if, they can, if we can get southern white rhinos to be surrogate parents for those rhinos. That species may come back from extinction thanks to the work of zoos. Uh, we're really focused on conservation and research. This is the horned toad project that we're doing, reintroducing these guys back into the wild. There's a little picture of one of our playgrounds. This is, um, we had to teach the state how to license this because they've never licensed anything like this before in their lives. But that's our playground. It's stump climbs, it's rock crawls, it's hills. You'll see the kids playing on us a little bit later on a video. Uh, here's a video of the opening, grand opening of the school. Today is going to be a fantastic day because today we are here for the grand opening of Will Smith Zoo School. We 
were proud and, and honored to have people here today to share our story of how we began, where we're going, so that we can impact the community. Today we had officials from the Texas Department of Health, Texas Parks and Wildlife, county officials, city officials, state legislators. When children learn and play in nature, they are healthier both physically and mentally. They have higher self-esteem. They feel and have a better connection with nature and will be tomorrow's conservation stewards. What I'm mostly concerned about is that I raise a child who's compassionate, that has respect for his peers and for his teachers and for the environment. And that's something that you can't get anywhere. And you only get it here at the zoo school. When the school first opened and we saw the kids run in, the joy on their faces, the excitement. I used to be like afraid to climb trees because I was afraid I was gonna fall. When I went to zoo school, like we would like climb on these logs like this. And so now I love climbing trees. I think that I wanna come here every day and that I don't wanna leave. This is the, the greatest thing I think that I've ever been a part of. The mission of what this school is, is incredible and, the, and these generations of kids that we're gonna put out into the world that are gonna be conservation minded. Will died in 07. For 10 years I've tried so hard to keep his memory going by spreading his love around San Antonio and I'm just so excited to have something that's this monumental. I mean this is a dream that is coming to life. What this place is about is bringing power two and four children. Go on the website, sazooschool.com, click on the enrollment request form and fill that out and we'll contact you in February of the enrollment year. We love Zoo School. That's our school. Uh, so there's, as you can see, just going through this presentation, I don't really talk about the animals at the zoo a lot. Really what the zoo's doing is things like that, the school and the research center. And the ways that we're doing that is really social media is really important to us. That's the best way we found a message to people. Uh, when I got to the zoo just four years ago, we had 19,000 likes on the, zoo, on the page. Um, so we've really ranked that, cranked that up. I think we're about 171 today, 171,000. So that's very important for us. Um, Timothy the hippo has become famous for us. He writes love letters to another uh, hippo in Cincinnati named Fiona. And it, yes. Uh, some Cincy people back there. Uh, Fiona's sending him a birthday present tomorrow because his birthday's this weekend, so we're expecting a present from Fiona tomorrow. Um, Jeffrey Giraffe, you'll see a little bit about that. When Toys R Us went out of business, we asked, uh, publicly asked uh, Toys R Us to give us the rights to Jeffrey the Giraffe to use for conservation. Um, you're seeing now on TV, the hot shows on TV are shows about the Bronx Zoo, about the San Diego Zoo is about to launch on Animal Planet, and the show about Australia Zoo and Steve Irwin's family. And then people visiting us to create what realms of take, taking people to faraway places so they, they feel like they're in Africa, or they feel like they're in Asia, or they feel like they're in Australia. That's all very important through us, and we do that through signage. And then we're even training now our docents and our employees on pathways as actors. So they're acting as safari rangers and things like that on pathways. Um, our mission, we really focus on, we divide our team into two categories really, and it really enforces to the animal care and the conservationist and the educationist why those other departments exist and why we do things like build a carousel or build a restaurant because they're mission delivering. So those departments that support our mission, we, we label them mission delivering in the, at, at the zoo so everybody knows what their role is. And then the mission, ena mission enabling, I'm sorry, and the mission delivering are those, are those departments such as animal care, conservation and research and education. And so for us, we have nine vice presidents, six departments. Six of our departments are mission enabling. So our revenue team that does food service and merchandise and catering, our marketing team, our development person that's doing team that's doing fundraising, our operations vice president, um, our guest experience vice president, our vice president of finance, and then you see the, three, the other three that are really delivering the message. And so it's a very diverse team. Um, Alan Carden, our VP of Animal Care, has been there for 43 years. It was his very first job as a teenager, and he's been there ever since. Um, Stacy's been there 15, 20 years now, and she started our nature-based preschool 16 years ago, so way ahead of its time, which nature-based preschools are exploding now. Um, Dr. Fenolia, who does work all over the world. Um, Kat, our VP of Revenue, came from 20-something um, years at SeaWorld. Hope Roth came from um, Sinclair Broadcasting and some large car dealership chains. Julia, our Vice President of Development, came from the uh, University um, Education System. Um, Ash Harris in the middle came from, he was at Dollywood and, and Astroworld when Astroworld was around and the Campbellback Ski Resort. So a lot of great experience with the team that we have there. So it's a nice mix of um, knowledge from people that have been there 20 to 30, 40 years and new infused talent from a lot of places like Disney, um, Six Flags, SeaWorld and some other places. So we talk about the power of social media and the stories that we're doing. We're really working to take those stories uh, make them fun because it gets attention. Um, a lot of our stories have gone internationally viral. 
Um, we've had some WWE wrestlers try to wrestle at one of our, try to tug of war one of our lines and couldn't budge her. You'll see that in the video. Timothy went international. Our Jeffrey story went international. And so we take those stories that are fun and then we put a an educational twist on it. And Timothy the hippo, who's pictured here, that's his profile picture on his Facebook page. He, um, We've taken the opportunity with Timothy and Fiona to explain to people how um, zoos like AZA accredited zoos move animals around and decide where animals will go because Timothy kind of has this little campaign that Fiona should move to, to San Antonio. <laughs> and, and everybody in Cincinnati goes crazy every time we say it. They all want Timothy to move to Cincinnati. But now people are learning how the zoos do this and why they do this. So we're, we're taking that advantage of that um, fun opportunity to really teach. And that's what the zoo is about. You come to the zoo for fun, and then while you're there, we're taking the opportunity to teach you and tell you our story. And so the next video is just a little bit of just 2018, some of the fun viral things that happened at the zoo and just some fun news stories that we had and some things that we did. Jeffrey the giraffe signifies fun and childhood memories. Uh, San Antonio Zoo started a GoFundMe campaign to help raise awareness for giraffes. What we're asking is that the executives at Toys R Us uh, would, would allow us to be the stewards of Jeffrey, their mascot, as a way for us to raise awareness for giraffe conservation. Well, a hippopotamus who calls the San Antonio Zoo home wants to get to know a rather famous hippo a little better. Zoo employees have posted letters to Fiona from Timothy, and they've gone viral quickly. We work with other zoos to really make sure that these animals continue to thrive in the care of man. Uh, as they're disappearing in the wild, it's becoming more and more important for zoos to be able to um, keep these species, uh, study them, learn from them, and really take those lessons back out to the wild and try to help the animals in the wild. The zoo cut the ribbon at the Will Smith Zoo School yesterday. A unique school in San Antonio, Texas is teaching young children all about the great outdoors with the help of some very wild friends. The children spend a small amount of time inside in the traditional classroom setting and the majority of their day is spent outside. The educators, the wonderful teachers that we have here, the animal care specialists who, who take care of the animals and then showcase those animals. Those are the heroes because they're making it possible for San Antonio Zoo to uphold our vision, which is securing a future for wildlife. The monkey manhunt at the San Antonio airport Monday could only be described as bananas. Dawkins, a 10-year-old rhesus macaque monkey, escaped his crate and the wild animal chase was on. We got a phone call from our friends at San Antonio Airport saying that there was a monkey loose. Even though Dawkins was not a member of the San Antonio family, we felt uh, a duty to go help Dawkins. Well, a new campaign from the San Antonio Zoo called Straws No Moss needs your help to keep our community clean. We really want the citizens here to understand that if you throw something on the ground or it falls out of a, a dumpster truck or things like that, it's going to end up in a waterway most likely and end up in the Gulf of Mexico. Over 500 million plastic straws are used in the U.S. every day. The goal is to get you to stop using plastic straws and single-use plastic whenever you can. Tomorrow, it is Zoo Rassic Park. See what we did there, Zoo Rassic Park. We've got 15 animatronic dinosaurs spread throughout the entire San Antonio Zoo. And our goal is to invite you to rethink extinct.
That, that was just some of the fun we had in 2018. We've, we're already off to a great start in 2019. We announced um, just two days ago we're acquiring um, the, 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 the Amer America's oldest children's theme park, um, Kitty Park, which is located in San Antonio, right across the park from us, is going to move inside the zoo and help us become a mission-enabling part of our, our programming. Uh, so really what it comes down to is storytelling, and I tell my team all the time this, especially when I got to the zoo, and uh, when I got there, there was the one elephant issue, and we were getting um, beat up in the media and beat up by some city council and protesters and those kind of things, um, and my lessons learned from SeaWorld, and what happened there was if you don't tell your story, someone will make one up for you, so definitely you need to be telling your story all the time continually and really get out there in the community and, and be part of the community, so that's what we've been doing. And so with that, I thank you for your time, and... I uh, appreciate having you. Having me. Tim. Tim, thank you so much. I, I think we can all agree that the aspect of storytelling uh, is so important, especially as zoos and aquariums continue to take uh, such a controversial issue. But thank, thank you. you for thank sharing you. your story. Tim will be back at our panel for Q&A uh, following our next speaker. <laughs>